I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my Good evening, church. It's a blessing to be able to open God's word this morning, afternoon, and evening. My name is Andrew. I'm the minister at St. Stephen's Presbyterian Church at Flemington, and we welcome you to our YouTube channel. Uh, we're continuing our series on the book of Galatians, and so I do invite you to open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 to 15. Uh, Galatians chapter 1, uh, Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 to 15. I'm going to read it, I'm going to pray, and then we'll look at the text together. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 to 15, this is God's word. For freedom Christ has set us free, stand firm therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you, that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, but you who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, not but only faith working through love. You are running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Verse 13. For you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another... Watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Amen. 
Well, let us pray as we think about this particular passage. Oh, gracious God, we do give you thanks, especially for your word. We're thankful that we can study it together. We can hear it read and preached on YouTube. Oh God, may your spirit bless us wherever we are. Be working in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 to 15, freed to love and serve. Well, if you're a Christian this morning, afternoon, evening, what does Christian freedom mean to you? When you think about Christian freedom, what does it look like in your daily life? If you're a visitor on our YouTube channel, if you're yet to commit yourself to Jesus, what do you think the Bible means by Christian freedom? And maybe what comes to mind is the ability to do whatever I want because I'm saved by grace. Maybe that's what you think Christian freedom is. Maybe what comes to mind is the right to make decisions based on what you're convicted of. Maybe what comes to mind is being able to make any choice in life because God has given me the freedom to do so. Well, we're going to be thinking about Christian freedom a little bit today. But let me give you a bit of context and a summary. Because in verse 1, it tells us that Christ has set us free from the bondage of sin and the requirements of the law. Because on the cross, Jesus Christ satisfied what the law demands. Uh, Paul has over and over again talked about the reality of the cross. He has talked about the reality of God's grace in salvation. Over and over again, Paul wants to say that salvation can't be obtained by Good works or doing things for God. Salvation is by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And the temptation of the church in Galatia and the temptation for us this morning, afternoon, evening is that we can so easily fall into the trap of trusting in ourselves and what we can do or what we have done. And so by So if you think about it for a second, if you have to meet God right now and he asks you, why should he let you in heaven? What would you instinctively say? And if you say anything but but God's grace alone through Jesus Christ alone, you have missed out the point. You see, it's not because you're good, not because you've done things for God, not because you've given money to the church, not because you've been baptized or you're an elder or minister of the church. The only reason God will let you in heaven is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And so the temptation in the church of Galatia and the temptation for us this morning, afternoon, evening is to trust anything else but Jesus. And last week we said that we are to stand firm on the truth of the gospel and not fall into the temptation of law-based salvation. And now maybe you are sick of Paul saying the same thing over and over again. But what is interesting is we're up to chapter 5 and Paul keeps saying the same things. He talks about God's grace and rejects law-based salvation. Uh, We can see him emphasize these things in verse 2 to 12. I want to draw your attention to verse 5 and 6. Specifically, For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith through love. And so you may have seen those key words, through the Spirit, by faith, or in verse 6, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. It doesn't count for anything. Only faith working through love. Uh, You may have noticed, though, Paul introduces this aspect of faith working through love. And this morning, I want to tease out what he means by faith working through love. He's going to flesh out for the rest of the book what saving faith looks like in practice. He's going to talk about the application of these truths. And at the end of this little section, after talking about false prophets of the law again, he says in verse 13 to 15, For you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. 
For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. And so at the very core of our text, Paul says we are freed from the bondage of sin. We are freed from the laws of demand. We are freed from the punishment that we deserve. We are freed to love and serve. And so we're going to be thinking about those things today. I want to first look at the fact that we are freed to fight sin and temptation. Because that's the first thing we have to realize. A poor elsewhere can imagine that there may be some people who are excited that we're saved by grace alone. And that by that fact, our sin does not count, our sin does not count towards us. And so they're thinking, well, that means I can do whatever I want. And he says in Romans 6, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin, sin still live in it? And so Paul says, yes, we are saved by grace. Yes, even if we sin by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, it's not counted to us. But that does not mean you can do whatever you want. It does not mean you can live in sin, live for self. And in our Galatians passage, he says it this way. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Don't use your Christian freedom to live in sin and temptation because you're saved by grace. It doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. You would be missing the point of being freed. Christian freedom is freedom from sin, not freedom to sin. We need to get that clear. Freedom from sin and not freedom to sin. Our freedom in Christ does not give us the freedom to do whatever we want, to live for self, to be self-indulgent. Jesus Christ on the cross did what? Save us from sin. And that's the whole point, right? And so when Paul says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue to sin so that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? You see, Jesus Christ freed us from the bondage of sin to be co-heirs with Christ. We are free to live the new identity, the new life in Jesus. We are children of God, adopted children of God. So live as children. I love what Paul says in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Look into Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And so in Hebrews 12, we as Christians are to fight sin, run away from sin and temptation. The flesh which tries to entangle us. And we are to look to Jesus. And so friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, this morning, afternoon, and evening, a very serious question you need to ask yourself. Are you living in self-indulgence and sin? Are you living for flesh? Are you living for self? Or are you living for Jesus? If God was to look at your life, if he was going to, to put a microscope in the daily aspects of life, will he see the DNA of a child of God or will it look like the flesh? Paul says we are free to fight sin and temptation, free to fight against the flesh. That's the first thing. The second half of that verse, that very verse, tells us that we're not only free to fight sin and temptation, but we are free to love and serve. But through love, serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so do you see what Paul has to say about Christian freedom? We are called to love and serve one another. 
And you'll notice Paul talks about the law in verse 14. And so he doesn't disregard the law. Although we cannot gain acceptance by keeping the law, there are truths about God and morality which we are to live by today. And so Paul points to the moral laws and says this is a good and right thing to do. It's a good and right thing to love and serve one another. It's a righteous thing to do that. And so isn't that interesting? When we normally think about freedom, we usually think about absolute liberty, absolute freedom to decide what we want to do. And I can imagine some saying, that doesn't sound like freedom then. And that is why we always need to go back to what Christ freed us from. Jesus has freed us from the bondage of sin and the requirements of the law. He has freed us to new life. And what this new life looks like is a life lived to love and serve one another. And that's interesting because we're no longer slaves, but children of God who serve. And if you read some of Paul's letters, he talks about himself as bondservant or slave. And Christians are described in that way. As Christians, as part of our identity in Jesus, we are free to love and serve one another. And that's a very hard thing to do. It is easy to love and serve those who like you, that you love, but it's a very hard thing to love and serve those who you are bitter against, or those who annoy you, those who disappoint you. We live in a world where even Christians are bitter against one another, who Christians are not nice to one another. And I can imagine even in the church or even in, that, in the room that you're in right now, there may be people you are bitter against. Uh, maybe you haven't come to church for a while because you're bitter against someone. Maybe you're bitter against me. And it's a very hard thing to love and serve one another. Can you imagine serving someone who ticks you off? who annoys you. We are called to a radical change of heart. And at the very core of this love and service is the work of Jesus Christ. What did Jesus do? Mark 10 verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We are called to follow our servant King who loved and served even those who rejected him. He died for sinners, you and me. And we are called to imitate Jesus Christ, the servant king. You know, it's a very hard thing to love and serve supernaturally. And that's why we need God's spirit living in believers to enable us to love and serve in a Christ-like manner. As we think about St. Stephen's, as we think about our church, how can we be a church which is reflecting Christ. How can we be a church which shows Christ's love and service? And so in your own life, does it reflect Christ's likeness? Or does it reflect self-centeredness and self-indulgence? Uh, next week, we will look at the fruit of the Spirit. And you'll notice that all these good and good things, these good and character qualities, it's the power of the Holy Spirit working in believers. It's a supernatural work of good. It means even God can change the most selfish person to the most loving and caring person. In essence, Paul is saying, we are free to live in the power of the Spirit. We are free to live expecting God to be working in our hearts. We are free to live the new life God has saved us for. We are free to love and serve just like Christ Jesus did. The servant king who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And I pray that you would want that. I pray that you would want St. Stephen's to be a church which looks like that. I pray that when the world looks at your life, they would see the power of God working in a supernatural way to enable you to love and serve that reflects Christ Jesus, and that they would be amazed, and that they would want to know him more. And so going back to Christian freedom, how are you using your Christian freedom? 
Christ has set you free from the bondage of sin and the law's demands. How are you using your salvation? And so let me challenge you this morning, afternoon, evening, as we close, to look at your life. Look at your time, your energy, your money, your direction in life, your family, and ask yourself, am I living the life God has called me to and saved me for? Is it a life of love and service, or is it a life of self? And we will look at application a bit more in the next couple of weeks. But let me leave you with God's authoritative word. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Amen. Let me pray. Oh God, it is a very hard thing. To love and serve one another. It's a hard thing to do. And so we need your Holy Spirit to enable us to love like Christ. To serve like Christ. Not because it saves us. But it's a reflection of your good work in us. Help us to apply our new identity in a real way. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Shield and high.